pledge. Every vote matters in every part of this state. The man or woman who wins the governor's mansion gets one more vote than the other person. That's how you win in this state. But we're a one percent state. Trump won the state. Deep breath. By one and a half point. Barack Obama was reelected in 2012 by one point. Barack Obama won the state in 2008 and a Florida landslide by two and a half points. That's what we call a Florida landslide. And the last three, four governors who were the Democratic nominees for governor all lost by one point. Roughly between 63 and 68,000 votes. In a state of 20 million people, our elections have come down to about 70,000 votes. It's incredible. And by the way, include in that that in two of those races, Rick Scott's races, we were overspent by over a hundred million dollars. Overspent by a hundred million dollars and even still, Florida is a one percent state. So we have to do everything that we can to rally as many people as possible to get out and vote the Democratic way. Why the Democratic way? Because it's also their way. When our issues are on the ballot, we win. Whether it was solar that just passed overwhelmingly, whether it was mar medical marijuana, which passed overwhelmingly, whether it was limiting class size in this state, which also passed, on the issues, we win. Now we just got to figure out a way to put a candidate in front of the voters that will also win. I believe, so it probably is no secret, I believe that I'm that candidate. <laughs> I'm wearing y'all hat because I believe, I believe that I'm that candidate. I do. I do. I do. And I realize I want to level with you. I want to level with you. I want to level with you honestly because I don't want you to have this debate outside of this room. We can have it while we're in here. The truth is, is I realize that I don't look like anybody who should be dreaming, let alone thinking about running for governor, right? Uh, th th this is if we were to go with our traditional model. I don't necessarily come from the right family or the right pedigree. I don't have a famous name. My mama and daddy worked hard, but they weren't governors. But I've worked hard. I've leaned into challenges. We have a story and a good story to tell about what we've done in Florida's capital city. I have ideas that motivate me and sometimes I can't even sleep through the night. I'm rolling over, my wife gets so mad, I'm writing ideas down on pads next to papers. Right? But the truth is, is that it's actually not about me. I knew this a long time ago as a young man, that it isn't about me. My daddy told me early, he said, son, don't believe the hype. If you believe what people say good about you, you'll believe what they say bad about you, and you'll be a slave to them both. So I realize that it isn't about me. What it really is about, y'all, the reason why we have to win again, is because of the lives who hang in the balance when we don't win. The one and a half million people who do not have health care today because we didn't win. The children are literally being pushed out of the public education system because they're being called failures, labeled that they have no future. They lose in that process. The, the, the men and women across this state who, getting, who are like my parents who got up every day working hard to make a way for themselves and for their families, who are finding it harder and harder to do that here in this state because we celebrate low-wage jobs and we do nothing to diversify this state's economy and create jobs with dignity again. They lose when we lose elections. These issues are on the ballot. And they're on the ballot by virtue of a candidate who is willing not to shrink from the challenges, but to lean into the challenges that confront this state. Who are willing to speak truth to power and are willing to stand up to bullies. When marriage equality was won all across this country, and we had county after county, largely across the northern panhandle of the state, saying that they would no longer issue marriage licenses, I said, as the mayor of Tallahassee, come to your capital city, where we believe love is love is love, and we'll marry you. We'll marry you. When our governor said that Syrian refugees, people who were literally being pushed and persecuted out of the country, were not welcomed in the state of Florida, never mind, he doesn't have the power to say who's welcomed in the state of Florida. Those are national immigration laws, but he took umbrage and did it anyway, so I thought, well, let me do it. <laughs> so I said, the capital city is a welcoming city. In the tradition of Jesus, we welcome the immigrant and our neighbor.
We welcome them. And that, yes, we believe in a thorough vetting process. Who wouldn't? But after you make it through that process, we have a responsibility as a global leader and a moral leader in this world to stand up when people are being persecuted and pushed out. Those are when our values are most important, when it's hard, not when it's easy. It's easy to believe in something when nobody's testing it. It's much more difficult when people are afraid and they're feeling pressed down, and maybe even for good reason. But what our leaders ought to be doing is not, is not taking advantage of that fear, but trying to inspire people to a higher level and to remind us of what it is we believe as a people. That's what we should be doing. So I am, in case you haven't noticed, I am excited about this journey. I really am. I, I know. I've, been, I've told you what some of the challenges are, and I've told you some of my thoughts around how we get around some of this. And I believe I've got the energy to move around this state, uh, evidenced by the last 48 hours that we had moving up and down and around this state, uh, and, and, and the next 18 months that are in front of us. And this will not be an easy journey. I know that. I'm so thankful for my beautiful wife, RJ Gillum, and my set of twins who are turning three in May uh, at home. Beautiful, amazing babies, Jackson and Caroline. And I got a third on the way, like I need another thing to do. We've been busy. Uh, and the, one of the only reasons why my wife is on this, is she says, you know what, at least our kids aren't in grade school, which means they don't really follow the news. So all the things that they're going to say about me and the caricatures they'll create about me, we'll at least be able to protect our littlest. Uh, uh, from knowing that. Now, if we win, and when we win, we'll have to deal with that, but I welcome that challenge uh, as well, right? I welcome that. So, I'm going to wrap up my comments because I know you all have questions, but I, I just want to say, uh, if you give me the chance to be your nominee for governor, you will not find somebody who will work harder than me. I plan to get up every single day moving all across this state, trying to compel people in every corner of this state why it is that they ought to trust us with leadership again, why they ought to trust their future into us, and why our ideas are better than the other person's ideas, why people ought to be put in the controlling seat rather than the special interests and lobbyists who right now run Tallahassee. We ought to be able to lead again in this state. Why? Because there are more of us than there are of them. And we hope through our election we're going to prove that and we're going to show that to them. So I hope y'all will join me on this improbable yet wholly possible journey. It's wholly possible. It's wholly possible. And if we get together and do this thing, we're going to set a different kind of record for who Florida is, and I hope you'll be with me. God bless you. Look forward to engaging with you. Thank you, Mayor. Now, we may have other candidates for governor, but after listening to the mayor, doesn't matter. We have a great one, at least, right? Now, we're going to take uh, questions. Um, so, let's start over here. Thank you so much for being with us today, Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. For You've thing. inspired us all. Thank you for that. Um, my question today regards access to affordable health care. My question is, would you please share your overall perspective, Mayor Gillum, yeah. on the major challenges ahead in ensuring Floridians have access to quality health care, and any specific objectives, priorities, and values that will guide you as governor Absolutely. in tackling this issue? Absolutely. Excellent question, and I appreciate uh, uh, the depth of it as well. So the, the first impediment and the first thing we need to change is we've got to get rid of Rick Scott uh, and, the, and the Republicans controlling the legislature. And I don't say that just as a political throwaway. Literally, this decision came down to the executive of this state and the legislature on whether they would expand access. I will tell you, I went to D.C. earlier this week, and it just so happened. Uh, the governor usually flies privately, uh, and this time he did commercially. Um, uh, and we were seated right back to front of each other. Uh, we, we were going to D.C. for two very different reasons. He was going to become President Trump's prop. Uh, and the repeal and the introduction of this new uh, health care law or uh, decoupling of health care. Um, 
And I was going to champion and encourage a number of the members of Congress to stand firm in their support of Obamacare. Now, I believe we're going to do that, by the way. I think Democrats will hopefully be a firewall. But I'm also hoping that we'll get some reasonable Republicans in the, in the, in the United States Senate who will do that as well. You mentioned some of the Florida um, statistics which, with regard to supplemental uh, security income. And, and we should also note that Florida has led the nation nearly doubling those in our state who will qualify, going from 17 to 35 percent of folks in our state who will qualify for, uh, for that assistance. Uh, we've got to do everything that we can, and, and this, is, this, this is where it comes in that, that elections have consequences. We're not real sure what this is ultimately going to be coming out of Washington, D.C., but I think they have forecasted enough for us that these, they haven't seen a voucher that they don't love. And what this is ultimately about is the vulturizing of this system, which provides less coverage, less security. That, the, vouchers, absolutely. And, and what we've got to do is we've got to stand firm in front of that train and make it a couple of people walking and then turn them back around and send them back the other way. We've done that before, and I saw a sign for AARP outside as I was walking in, but they've taken a public position against this bill. They've taken a public position against this bill. And we, and we have to encourage that. The other thing our state could have done is we could have established exchanges. And you know what? All Republican governors didn't, it didn't resist the ability to establish those. There were Republican governors who actually established exchanges under the Obamacare. Uh, and our state obviously resisted that, and we also resisted the extension of, of, of Medicaid. So we've got to make sure that we're doing everything we can to give the wind at the backs of Democrats and common sense Republicans in Washington, D.C., want to kill this bill. This bill should not move any further. Now, mind you, the, uh, I think maybe the, maybe the cards are stacked when it comes to the House. But I think we've heard enough uh, in the United States Senate that the way that it looks in the House, it won't look the same uh, 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 in the Senate. But frankly, we're very interconnected with what, ha what happens with this legislation in Washington, D.C. And if Obamacare is able to survive, if, if it's able to survive and they're not able to destruct it, and by the way, we know that there are some improvements that can be made. We ought to be the first state in line to extend Medicaid access to the medically needy in this state. We ought to be the first state in line to do that. And we need a governor who can do that. And by the way, hospitals agree with us. You even have physicians groups uh, that are out there advocating because they know the, the, that the system as it exists today does not work. And the biggest giveaway that's in here are to prescription uh, drug companies. That's who wins in this. We don't win, we lose. So we've got to stiffen our spines in this fight, y'all, because um, uh, it's going to take all of the capacity that we have to call both Democrats and Republicans in the Senate to write in and to phone in, to send your own stories, because as I said before, there are real people who hang in the balance here. And unfortunately, this is one of those scenarios where we and the federal government are inextricably linked that what happens there has a direct impact on what we're able to do in this state. But assuming we're able to preserve uh, Obamacare, uh, it would be my first decision, uh, if we're fortunate in this race for governor, to lean into that challenge by one, establishing the exchanges, which could be a major, play a major facilitatory role in this state to reducing costs and expanding coverage, but also into making sure that we, we do what we ought to do and do what's right by the extension of Medicaid uh, in this state. And I'll just say this other thing, and this wasn't in the question, but as it relates to Social Security, a right that you all have worked hard for. We ought to, we ought to this isn't a gift, you paid into it, and you ought to be able to get out of it what you paid into it. We've got to be on the lookout for the voucherizing of that system as well. Paul Ryan has forecasted this, and we've heard this repeatedly from Republicans. So not only do we have to be awake and active on this Medicaid and Medicaid expansion, but we also have to be awake and active when it comes to their efforts to privatize this system, making it less safe, less affordable, less accessible for the folks who need it most. And there's no state who will be impacted uh, as crucially as the state of Florida will be. So I hope to join you in that challenge. Over here. Good morning, uh, Mayor. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Larry Gilbert, and I'm a member of the Civil Rights uh, Political Action Team. And uh, my question deals with uh, transgender and LGBTQ rights. Uh, it is an issue very close to my heart. As a grandfather of identical twins, 
who were born with female bodies four and a half years ago. One identifies as a boy. He was born and given uh, he was born and given the name Eva, af named after my mother, and now identifies as Alex. There's no doubt in our family's mind as to his identity, as it is persistent, consistent, and insistent. This has been confirmed by doctors in the field in Boston, Massachusetts, and in my native state of Maine. The question is, will you support uh, anti-discrimination uh, and, and sign into law bills that will protect from harassment and bullying in schools for uh, not only uh, LGBT, uh, LGBT, to include LGBT, uh, in schools from bullying and, and sign into law uh, <clears throat> such legislation. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that question and, and thank you also for sharing your own uh, personal uh, story, your own personal experience with that. Nothing like twins. Nothing like twins. Uh, uh, I, I love mine, that's for sure. Um, so what I failed to mention when I talked about the whole marriage issue um, is before that was ever settled by the courts, uh, I introduced and led in Tallahassee a non-discrimination ordinance in hiring um, uh, and also firing a protected class to extend that uh, protected provision to uh, L, lesbian, G, gay, B, bisexual, T, trans. No, I shortened it, I said trans, but transgender, absolutely. So, so that is included in the protections, and, and I have to tell you, it's amazing because Jacksonville, Florida, Duval County just passed, just passed, this was after two years of back and forth, a human rights ordinance that says you can't be fired for being LGBT. They just, I mean, I guess, yes, yes, we should applaud them for finally getting there. But it's 2016, it's 2017, y'all. It's 2017. And the fact that, which, which just reminds me that we really can't take any of these rights for granted. None of us would have ever thought we'd be here. Uh, with the rhetoric that comes out of Washington, D.C., out of President Trump, uh, the groups that are targeted, None of us thought we would back, be back at where we are. This is, this is 2017 and we should be far past it, but it reminds us that we have to be ever vigilant. Uh, we can't take any one of these rights and privileges for granted because there are interests that are out there that are fighting to rip away at them at their first opportunity, evidenced by this president, this administration, his advisor, Steve Bannon, and the like. Cue the hissing, yes. But the man has an office in the White House an office in the White House. So I couldn't agree with you more on those protections. I think they ought to be expanded statewide. I also think we ought to have educational curriculums that speak to this because this next generation of folks, they don't even, this is not their issue, right? This, is, this doesn't become an issue for them. And so um, uh, 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 we've got to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to demysticize all of the horrible rhetoric that's out there that divides us and causes us to, uh, frankly, um, see really precious lives taken um, um, at an unprecedented suicide rate in this country, largely among young LGBT and Q individuals. It's a real challenge and we have to lean into it. And I absolutely uh, uh, would be in favor of expanding those protections, but also in introducing curriculum that demystifies people's knowledge and what they do not know uh, about, this, about this issue and about those critical lives. Thank you for the question. Good morning, Governor. Thank you for being here. I'll take it. <laughs> yes. Oh. Listen. Hey. Hey. Hey, hey listen. Script, scripture tells us to speak those things that are not. Good one. I'll take it. I'll take it. My question is referring to the Sable Trail Pipeline. We are all aware of the Alaska Pipeline. We're aware of the Dakota Pipeline. But are we aware? that we here in Florida, specifically Central Florida, where we sit right now, that the Sable Trail Pipeline is running through several of our counties and through our aquifers. 
The Sable Jail pipeline is carrying natural gas from Alabama through Georgia, from Pennsylvania, joining together and passing right through Central Florida. My question is, what will you do as our governor to ensure that regulatory oversight is conducted and enforced so that we have safe, secure availability of our water? Absolutely. It's a great, it's a great question. <clears throat> Now, obviously, uh, and, and uh, uh, Barbara, you know that the, the Sable Trail uh, uh, has, uh, has left the station uh, in, in some ways. And so what this comes down to is making sure that our regulatory systems uh, are in place uh, to make sure that our groundwater is protected. Uh, and where I live, we live above the Floridan Aquifer in northern, uh, in, in northern Florida. Um, very, very, very important and precious resource uh, to us. In fact, we... Um, have a spray field where we were previously treating um, uh, water just below drinking level and now we are treating it at the tertiary level just to make sure that the nitrates that go in the ground don't go, don't perk uh, down and, and, and contaminate uh, our natural uh, drinking system and we leaned into that frankly without being forced to. I mean it had to be a compromise amongst a number of partners up there in order to make that possible and make that happen. Um, while this governor doesn't believe in science, and I'm not sure how well relies on experts, and I really don't have a lot of faith in the regulatory uh, environment because of the attacks on regulation and bills like the ones that I mentioned that are being offered at the legislature that is preempting us, even at the local level, um, uh, 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 from implementing additional layers of, of protection uh, for our natural resources and our natural environment. Um, I would like to see a panel convened of experts to include scientists uh, who will operate on a regular basis assessing what the long-term implications and impacts are, uh, not only uh, uh, in this scenario, but also as it relates to Lake Okeechobee, uh, um, for the groundwater contamination through the nitrate and the perk level that's happened uh, in that area. We've got algae blooms that are guacamole content flowing out of the east and the west side of this state. And the regulations as they exist today within the Department of Agriculture under Adam Putnam is a request that the uh, uh, farming industries and developers pursue what they call uh, best practices. So you, they just have to demonstrate on paper a plan to be in pursuit of best practices is pretty much how they regulate these folks. And I know what that means. That means you don't have hard lines. There are no bright lines. There are no clear lines. Uh, and unfortunately, when I say special interests have run roughshod, that is to include major moneyed interests in this state who has been able to stave off real regulation that has real impact at curbing some of the deleterious effects of, of contamination uh, of our groundwater system, but also contamination uh, of our lakes uh, 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 and our waterways in this state. And so we've got to badly and sorely re-implement and establish a balance again on regulation uh, and on the, and the public safety interests uh, because over the last 20 years, they've really gone by the wayside. Um, but it takes leadership. Uh, and it takes an administration who actually believes that uh, although, you know, in my faith tradition, I believe there's Armageddon and, and, and maybe an end of the world. And, but for the time that we have it here, for the time that it's ours, we're good stewards of it. We have to take care of it and preserve it for generations and generations and generations to come. It's no excuse uh, not to do everything we can from the regulatory standpoint to ensure uh, the safety and the security of all of our environmental assets, most chiefly among them, aside from air, is our water. All right. Unfortunately, we have time for two more questions, but please don't leave. I have a couple important announcements before, and we have the 50-50. So, well, where were we last? Over here. Oh. I, I have a simple question and uh, a suggestion please. in regards to that question. My first question, my question is, um, is the state of Florida ready for a black governor? And in relation to that, I would like to suggest all of these wonderful Democrats here, who I know would love to see a black governor, uh, get a picture with you or at the podium and get it on your Facebook page. Okay. Begin to get that beautiful black face out there. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, I, I appreciate that question more than you know. Uh, that, <laughs> The, the beautiful black face part, particularly. Uh, 
Um, so, it, because it's one that sort of sits beneath the surface sometimes uh, with folks. Um, we talked about what the win ratios have been in this state. And I don't want to be presumptuous to make myself a comparison here, but the only time we've had a Florida landslide in the last 20 years has been with a black man with a beautiful black face uh, 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 on the ballot two and a half points ahead. And part of that is, and this is really important to understand in the midterms, because in the midterms, the folks who generally fall out of that process, that voting process, are black voters, brown voters, and young voters. I don't mean to be superficial about it, but I check a couple of those boxes. <laughs> and, but, but, but that won't be sufficient. Let me go further and say that the identity part won't be sufficient. You also have to have an agenda that appeals to each and every one of those groups because they feel in large part left out as well. That's why this debate around whether or not, um, as Democrats, we double down and talk only to our base or whether we expand and talk to working class white voters, the scenario we give around the public education challenge and the fact that people are feeling squeezed and left out with little opportunity is not just the challenge of working class white voters, working class black voters feel the same, as do working class Latino voters uh, as well, right? And so we actually, if we are able to, to be courageous enough to push past what I would call our superficial barriers, our superficial differences, to get down to the granular so that we can realize we actually got a lot more in this together than what it is that divides us, and if we just stop letting these guys who don't have our interests at heart tell white voters that the reason why they don't have better is because that black man or that Latino voter took your job or because we have policies that allow women to be treated equitably and pay fairly in this state we don't by the way but we should that somehow that's going to take away from you we can hold values that say a diverse constituency and a diverse, a diverse community and a diverse workforce force is good for our state and we don't mean that to your exclusion that you're also a part of that picture and so I think part of the recipe to winning one is making sure that we can get 70 more thousand of those young and and uh, young voters and voters of color to show up in midterms elections in November. And we don't need a movement size shift. We need marginal shifts. We just need a few more. We'll take them all. We will take them all. We will take them all. I, don't, I know that's right. Uh, but, but, but we don't, we, we, I, I say we don't need it all because I want you to understand that this task is wholly doable. It's wholly doable. But is the state of Florida ready for its first black governor? I believe we are, but that depends on y'all. And that depends on the rest of the state.